Um, I run the digital video efforts at Frontline and that really runs the gamut. It's all about sharing our journalism in different ways and natively on the platforms and meeting people where they are. And VR is just one more new tool in our toolbox for doing that, for telling really great, compelling stories. Um, and so, you know, I might, I oversee everything from like a Facebook video to an Insta story, to a 360, to a walk around VR project, to an interactive film. Um, yeah, and I've just been, I, I mean, I, I caught the bug, um, especially with the walk around VR. I think it's really exciting and I think it really is a very, very different medium from what we've had in the past. Uh, still a little bit skeptical on the journalism front for VR. Um, I definitely think VR has like great potential. Well, it's not going away and it will morph and change, you know, in years to come. But I do wonder for journalists um, how useful it, a tool it will be. Um, because again, elephant in the room, uh, access. And especially for the walk around VR, which I think is frankly a lot more powerful than 360. Um, but at the same time, only so many people will have headsets and even as price points come down, um, it's still going to be um, a small subset of the population that is allowed to basically consume and learn from our journalism and that's, we do journalism in the public interest and that just doesn't make any sense to us. So this is all about innovation, pushing the needle further and then we'll wait and see you know, how the landscape uh, develops. So yeah, so I'm here today to let you in on um, a secret, a few secrets, um, mainly lessons we've learned along the way, um, some stumbling blocks we've hit, um, some mistakes made so that you guys don't have to do that. Um, and hopefully um, it provokes some questions for any of you guys who are pursuing VR um, to consider as you start to develop your, your works. And so, I mean, I think for me, VR, um, it's obviously uh, entered the mainstream in terms of like a term and a medium and you see it everywhere from like ads um, to, I don't know if any of you guys have been to Fenway this year, they have a whole VR dugout. Um, they're in museums uh, and the museum just just get a whole new installation of like like several booths so that they can have rotating um, VR works there. Um, and I don't know if any of you guys watch Silicon Valley, but um, I do, and I've been getting a real kick out of the VR um, storyline this season. So I'm just gonna play a little clip from that. Wait, I don't know if this would be relevant, but he did say the word Oculus a whole bunch. Wait, Oculus? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh my god, it's a VR play. That's the frothiest space in the valley right now. Nobody understands it, but everybody wants in. Any idiot can walk into a fucking room, utter the letters V and R, and VCs will hurl bricks of cash at it. Then by the time they find out that it's vaporware, it's too late. <laughs> oh my god, to get in on this. So I'm hoping to let you in on it. I don't. I can't guarantee VCs are going to hurl cash at you to make it. Actually, the honest truth is there aren't uh, real substantial funds to make this work, especially the higher end um, walk around VR projects where you're trying to tackle something uh, that's narrative and is going to require a lot more work. Um, but I'll at least hopefully illuminate sort of how, oh sorry, we've been doing that. Um, so this is like super basic, actually I'm going to skip this really quick because actually most of you totally understand the differences um, between VR. It's used as a catch-all phrase, but obviously as most of you know, there's 360, um, which is like putting a fishbowl on your head, image gets, you know, mm -hmm. plastered around, which is actually quite substantially different from walk around VR, room scale VR, um, and we've been doing both actually. Um, um, but most of what I'll focus on today actually is going to be the walk around VR work. Um, one, because we've spent a lot of time and energy over the last year and a half um, trying to do narrative journalistic work in that, but mainly just because I like it more. So that's also why. But if you have questions on 360, we've done a lot of that too, and I can, I can certainly answer any questions. Um, so yeah, so today basically I want to take you on a VR odyssey with me, um, and I'm hoping to cover um, you know, Frontline. We're a television series um, we actually have. Um, explored new forms of storytelling for the last few years. We're not always known for it as we are for the legacy um, television broadcast, but we're working on it. And a lot of that innovation and really the willingness, which is sometimes scary, to um, tell our stories in ways that are different than the 52-minute film stems from our executive producer, Rainey 
Aronson, who took over uh, Frontline a few years ago. And so that evolution has come along with her. Um, and then I'll give you guys a behind the scenes look at the making of our VR documentaries. And again, I'm going to focus on the walk around room scale projects. Uh, and then what the research shows. So you might be wondering what research I'm talking about, and I'll explain that. Um, and then mistakes made along the way and how you can avoid them in your work, um, hopefully. So once upon a time, because that's how every good story starts, um, back in 2014, our, the executive producer, Rainey Aronson, as Sarah said, was a fellow here at the Open Doc Lab. Uh, she really decided she wanted to go back to school um, to authentically lead. She feels like she needs to have a basic understanding of these new technologies and new forms. And the form that really leapt out to her in terms of relevance to Frontline was um, VR really 360 filmmaking. Um, she's a filmmaker by trade. She actually had made a number of um, uh, documentaries and front lines prior to her uh, co becoming the executive producer. So she's a filmmaker at heart. And so that was one where it's like easiest to wrap her head around and be like, yeah, I get it. I could see how we could really um, uh, tell our, our journalism in new ways through this form. And so what you see actually over here is the very first project we did. Um, poor Dan Edge, he's a terrific filmmaker, but I say poor Dan Edge because uh, he's a traditional filmmaker, um, a jack of all trades, like a triple threat. He like shoots, he um, directs, he, he composes his own music, uh, he can do everything. And so we're like, well, why not VR if you can do everything else? Like, mm -hmm. here, take this camera. And by camera, I mean this like ridiculous GoPro rig. I think there were 12 <laughs> GoPros on there. And on top of making the 52 minute film, because y you have to do that first and foremost, also make a 360 documentary for the very <laughs> first time. And to top it all off, please do this in a very dangerous location, West <laughs> Africa, because this was actually during the Ebola outbreak, and it was not after the fact. It wasn't a story that was coming in after everything had been solved to figure out the why. But as the, the outbreak was continuing to, to grow, we were on the ground there. And so he is a trooper, and he brought the camera with him, and we learned so much. Um, I got some awards. and. Um, but even so, we cringe every time we look at it a little bit because the form has come so far. And really, we only had three, th three basically shots to play with, three scenes. Um, no interviews done in, in the settings. Um, uh, for most of the footage, one camera was out because that was a typical problem back then, overheating batteries. So there was tons of rotoscoping work to fix that and salvage the scenes. Um, but, but it was a good lesson in, in, in 360 filming and um, what not to do, for sure. Um, and so we would never again do a stereoscopic GoPro camera like that. Um, just not necessary. Uh, and so yeah, so we've done a variety of 360 documentaries at this point, um, almost a dozen of them. And uh, you'll see a <clears throat> lot of partners on here. And I think that's because it, it really, especially early on when the technology was so clunky, it took a village and it took a lot more money and it took a lot more time. And so it was important for us to be pooling our resources. And so now I'm just going to give you a little um, glimpse in this trailer of the types of stories we've been trying to tell in VR. Oops, no back. Yeah. Play. Experience Frontline in virtual reality. Journey through the heart of the Amazon in search of ancient ruins. To the oil fields set aflame by ISIS. In search of the oil fields that have been burning for the last two, three months. Twenty displaced people living in our home. If some of us don't have food, then we share what little we have. Mother Nature looking to eat not only my family but my community up. First, we have Cyrus, medical department number 126. Step inside the story. Years of it drove a relatively sane young man insane. Explore the clues of real life mysteries. See the world from a new point of view. Open your eyes. The front line. 
So that's a smattering of the different stories um, we've told in 360. And basically after a year of that, um, a marriage, an arranged marriage happened with us. Um, we were at uh, ONA and um, we've been talking with the Knight Foundation about really taking um, Rainey's learnings from MIT to the next level um, and pursuing sort of new forms, cutting edge forms of uh, storytelling for VR journalists and, I'm sorry, for journalists. And they were really interested in walk around VR and the potential that lays there. And so they m made a match, Shrasna made a match between Rainey, that's our executive producer, and Nani de la Pena, who is often known as um, the godmother of VR. Um, she did the Hunger LA project many years ago. It's one of the earliest projects. And um, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, so she at that point, the headsets were so expensive, I think, um, that the university where she did the um, Hunger LA, the headset was like $50,000. And they were like, you are not taking that to Sundance. Like, absolutely not. So she had to like jury rig and make her own headset. And she did that with her intern, um, a guy who you guys might know um, because he go went on to found Oculus. So he basically um, started these headsets. And so the, the grant from the Knight Foundation is basically to do this. It's to explore and push the envelope in terms of uh, VR journalism in the walk around space and really make sure that we um, share the lessons learned, um, the, the new challenges that VR presents uh, with uh, journalism. And I'll mention a couple of those, some new things that you know we just hadn't thought of, but it, it adds a new layer of um, uh, vetting challenges. Um, and then the technology, you know, how best practices, how can other journalists perhaps uh, take what we've learned and apply that to their newsrooms? And so, um, yep, so I said, room scale or walk around VR is what I'm going to focus on. We've done uh, <laughs> two projects to date. One is After Solitary, um, which focuses on one man's story of his time in solitary confinement and what, he, uh, what happened to him when he got out. Um, and that's made the circuit. I'm terrible at like promotion. I'm supposed to say it's won a bunch of awards. It got best VR at SoFi, and um, it recently took um, the best prize at World, uh, the v World VR Forum and ONA. And so it's it's gotten a lot of accolades. But it's even looking at it, um, we made this as our first project. Um, months later, you're already like, oh, the technology's gotten better, and so you can see more and more flaws. Um, but we did that and Greenland melting. So in terms of um, uh, after solitary, I'll start with that. Um, one of the primary tools we used um, to create this story is photogrammetry, which uh, some of you guys probably already know the basics of what that is. Um, but essentially what that is, is uh, taking a bunch of pictures. Um, you know, you just take a DSLR camera and you go ahead and you, you, you take a ton of pictures. And then what you're going to do is you're going to create a 3D mesh or map of the particular <laughs> object. And the reason why I have reality capture here is mm, when we started after solitary, this software wasn't around. This has made uh, life a lot easier for many people doing walk around VR um, because it will help sort of map the pictures to it. There was a lot more manual work that had to be done um, back in the day. So for after solitary, we got into the main state prison. Um, we'd actually been filming there for a documentary for a number of years. and. Um, Funnily enough, we'd actually aired the documentary, and so we figured that the prison was absolutely not going to let us back in. Certainly, when we, this time we say, now we want inside the cells to capture every single flaw detail of these these cells, and um, they were like, sure, actually. Um, so I think that you know speaks to Frontline a lot. And but they did, and they let us into those cells. And you know, one of the interesting things was for the documentary where we spent many years and, and many months embedded there, um, you could never go inside one of the cells because obviously we were filming with current inmates um, and it's a security hazard. You couldn't even, they talked about like setting up cameras and putting them in cages and so that you could get that sort of inside perspective from the cell and they said absolutely not, it's too much of a threat, too much of a danger and so for that everything had to be filmed outside the cell but this time we actually got inside one of the cells and so we used a company called Realities.io which is a German company that again was at the the the, the um, 
the, the frontiers of photogrammetry work at that time. And so that, you know, it took a whole entire day to film all those pictures. It took weeks and weeks and weeks to um, basically process the photogrammetry into that environment, right, that we're going to put into Unity. Um, but it's gotten a lot easier over the years, and this is one um, tool that has helped with that. And so as you said here, so as you see here, you've got this fountain. Um, and then again, this software <coughs> helps create the 3D mesh and then applies the colors and the photos to it. So you can even go back to the original one here. And so what you get is a really um, photorealistic uh, environment. And the other thing is the fidelity is kept. And that obviously does not happen with 360. And that's something that we've struggled with a lot. Um, you know, with 360, yes, you can shoot in 4K or whatever, but it's going to get spread around that globe, right? So you're not seeing the full 4K, you're seeing a piece of it. And so detail is really hard, and sometimes details matter. Um, and so it was super exciting for us to see the new potential that photogrammetry um, allows. So this is the actual cell that we um, did the photogrammetry work in. On a, over there, you can see a book on the counter. You can't quite see it over by the toilet, but there's um, a toothpaste and toothpaste, um, toothpaste and a toothbrush, and you can even see some ch chips of paint on the floor. You could see under the bed because we captured <coughs> capture that detail. So it's pulling that that um, data from these photos. So again, it keeps it when you get closer. I mean, that's the big thing, obviously, right? With 360, you can never get closer to an object. But then it sort of breaks reality for you because that is how it works in real life. You do get closer and I can make out the letters on my keyboard. Uh, and with photogrammetry, like here's the prison issued toothpaste and it's so good that you in the experience could go over that counter and you can read, you can start to read the drug facts, you can read the name of that. Same thing with the book, you could read the title of that book. Um, and when the environment is a character in your story, it's important that it's not just a blurry mess. So um, uh, the other reason why we chose to do it with photogrammetry is, as the first slide said, it's you know putting the reality in virtual reality. For frontline, and this is different from emblematic, and they were really interested in the messy tensions between the two because we both are journalists at our core, lots of journalism experience, but we come at it from different perspectives, and we all know like there's almost there's different flavors of journalism today, right? The intercept or field of vision is very different in terms of their standards than a frontline. Um, and so it's similar even in the VR space. So she did a lot of recreation work and still worked from a lot of source documents. But we said, but if you can capture reality, why wouldn't you capture the reality? Like, it's harder. It's more difficult. It's going to be more time consuming. But like, that's what we do is we tell, you know, we bring you to these places. We tell these true stories. And so if we're doing solitary. We want to go into a solitary cell. Um, so we really focused on that as opposed to recreations for the first two. Uh, and then the next step. Isn't the strategy of Noni is like doing something faster, not having like keeping the fast journalism alive in a way that it's like faster, but they're still not that fast. Yeah. I mean, like you know what I mean? Like they're you know like looking at um, the use of force or something like that. That still took her team quite a bit of time to do. Kia, it still took a quite a bit of time. I think the philosophy is right with some of this recreation work. You can do it quicker. So is that helpful for timely stories? But then I would say we'll do 360. Right? That's you can do that super fast. So. I don't know. It, it it sort of depends. For us, like we it, this we have our whole um, journalistic guidelines on our website website, and whenever we can, we really try to avoid recreations. We have to ask ourselves why recreate this? Like why, if you can capture it in any way, then why would you recreate versus do that? And so it's again a difference. Um, you can do it faster, but. We'd, yeah, we'd sacrifice it. Yeah, no, yeah. No, but it's interesting to, to understand the limit between journalism and documentary. Absolutely. Like Absolutely. And I would still argue that what she's doing is more documentary right now. I mean, use a forest or a Kia or something like that. But I'll be curious for some of these other shops that are starting to adopt it. Like, I mean, the New York Times has their daily 360, right? Yeah. Or is it a matter of time before they try to do walk around in a quick turnaround style? Maybe I'd be it'd be challenging. I mean, with the photogrammetry, it's gotten much better, especially because of reality capture. Can you just give a sense of how long it takes? 
Sure. So back when we did um, uh, After Solitary, I said it took a full day to shoot that. Or um, for the Greenland Melting Project, our second project, we were trying to photograph an entire NASA research ship, right? So that, again, took like a full day. And there's different techniques. Some people actually shoot with their DSLR cameras now, so they're taking video, which speeds it up. You're going to have, I think, probably a few more like errors or glitches if you're not doing it as like methodical and meticulously but quicker way and they turn them into JPEG and then they use the JPEGs to um, plug into the reality capture and cover the mesh so there are ways to do it much faster something like that cell with all that detail back when we were making it it took a full day to shoot it and then it took them probably a month to process two rooms that's it like it was um, the cell and then we did one scene um, outside of his cell actually there was three we ended up doing a bedroom scene at the end um, but for all three of those, like it took like a full month plus to like process it, and it's because it's so good. There's other ones where you can see the glitches and where things don't quite line up, and you know. But our bar is very high for frontline in terms of the quality. Um, but you can do it. You can do it quicker today for sure. Um, so that's just one part, right? You got the environment, right, that you're going to put into Unity. But now we need characters. We need to thread in intelligence. Um, and that's important for us. We do a lot of character-driven work. And so, again, a lot of people do, um, you know, transportive VR where they're just going to take you a place and you can just look around. And, like, that, that can be <coughs> exciting in and of itself. But we want to try to tell narratives with characters. And so to the Ebola film that we did, we didn't have characters, the interviews were hard to shoot, so what we did is we took the 2D interviews and we basically pasted them around the thing. And you know, it's like, well, that's not gonna work anymore. Again, it really breaks the fourth wall and you just like notice it, especially if you're like in a true space, trying to experience it as reality. So you need to do interviews. And so one of the um, tools that we used is uh, working with uh, 8i, um, who are at the, again, the front tiers of videogrammetry. And so, sorry, this is the Greenland Melting Project. So we had two scientists. So Greenland Melting, basically, um, is a story about what is happening to the glaciers of Greenland and a NASA expedition that happened uh, last September, where they went to better understand why these glaciers are melting faster and faster over the last 15 years. Um, they've been melting faster and faster, and they knew that, um, but they're trying to understand why and how much faster so they can adjust sea level rise projections because they fear that the models are significantly off. So we joined them on that NASA expedition, and it's these two leading NASA scientists who tell us a little bit about how they were doing their research in Greenland and what they found and what it all reveals. And so we took the scientist to 8i, and I think this is another important um, thing to mention, especially for journalists or documentarians. Uh, and this is getting better, but 8i has a studio in Santa Monica, and I think one in Australia. So it really limits the kinds of stories you can tell. So for example, we have this incredible story about um, mining in the uh, Peruvian jungles and there was some incredible investigative work that we were doing but most of the characters were not going to be able to leave you know um, some of these tribal people were just that's not a possibility or reality so you had to eliminate stories right off the bat the equipment that was going to be needed to do some of this photogrammetry work we couldn't get it into the jungle you had to climb for three days right and the humidity was so bad so it's limiting so for this even for the solitary one we had actually started the project back in the summer and it took us three entire months to finally find um, a former inmate that was able to travel to LA to the studios. Uh, and we would again had relationships we've built for three years with these guys. We had a number of people that were like totally game to tell their stories, but it's things like um, parole conditions. You can't leave the state for many of them. So they certainly were not going to be able to go to LA with us. Um, they're a lot for a lot of them they're just getting new jobs, right? And to ask them to take a whole entire weekend off is not a possibility for them. Um, a lot of them have PTSD and issues with claustrophobia and like small spaces. So planes obviously are not ideal. So it really <laughs> took like three whole months to find someone who can fly out to LA. So a real limiting factor. And you know, we try to tell stories of, you know, give voice to the voiceless and that's hard because 
there's just limitations. But the NASA scientists could go <laughs> out to LA and they weren't too far away from this studio. So it's a green screen studio. Um, and if you see uh, over here, this is the team that was doing Greenland melting. We did this with um, Nani's team and Nova uh, and Frontline. And so here you monitor all the different cameras um, on that board right there. And then inside the green screen room, you've got uh, approximately 50 cameras. Uh, and he, and you have your subject stand here. You have to be hidden, as you can see back here, behind these um, lights and ask your questions. So if you think it was already hard to get a really great interview with a really small camera, really intimately sitting close up to someone, and sometimes that is challenging, right, to get them to open up. Now imagine them in front of 50 cameras in a green screen room with like dozens of people, because to run all this, most of these people are 8 eyes crew. So it's really um, uncomfortable, to say the least. And, you, and I think you can actually see it in the interviews. They're stilted. They're definitely stilted, and it's hard. Um, to just get really good tape. So again, one of the technology challenges we face. Another thing that we face is, again, the 50 cameras, right? And it's all coming over here, I should say over here, right? To these um, screens that we're monitoring, making sure that everything is going right. Oftentimes they stumble on words or make a mistake. And in a traditional documentary, of course, you just cut that, right? And you cut the hands and you show the hands and then you, you deal with them flubbing up their words. But you can't make cuts when you're dealing with HVRs, which are these, you know, uh, holographic-like um, 3D models of the people, right, that is taken from all these cameras. You can't make those cuts. So that take has to be perfect. Whatever you're going to use has to be perfect. So in addition to, like, trying to get good information, uh, monitor that you've hit all the beats of the story that you need, uh, you have to be really critical as to whether they misstated something. Because again, sometimes people just misstate a fact and you can ask them again and you can make those cuts in a linear traditional documentary. You're not going to be able to do that um, with this HBR system. Um, so that's another challenge. And then another challenge is all those cameras equals lots and lots of data, right? And so you only get 40 minutes in a session because that's all that they can hold in the cloud, right, in their systems. So again, for the Putin film that we recently did, some of those interviews were four hours long, right, with these Russian officials to get them, you know, to get the information that you need. Um, for this, it's 40 minutes. Um, that's including like flub ups, you know, while it was running. And then you have to pick your selects and they can't keep, because again, it's storage. Imagine 40 minute sessions, multiple sessions every day. There's a, there's a real tech problem there where they can't store all that. So you get to pick your selects and then it's gone. So it's not even like, well, you know what? Like I really want to go back and do that. One, it's gone. Two, again, it's really expensive to process it. So you really have to storyboard. You really have to know what your story is um, right now while the technology is still in its sort of nascent forms. And there's ways that have been developed to jury rig this. Like we're doing this for a third project where we had um, the really the main character of our third project, which is a it's a murder investigation. And it's a story about a Silicon Valley murder and mm -hmm. what can go wrong with DNA. We think of DNA as foolproof, it exonerates people. But as the technology has gotten better, there's some new um, challenges that have emerged in the field of DNA forensics. And so we brought, um, the main character is a severe alcoholic um, with some mental health issues. We've been trying to track him down for a year and we finally got him and we knew again, he's not someone you can just like be like, hey, let's go to this green screen studio with 50 cameras and you just stand here, right? Um, he, that's not in the cards. So there is ways to like jury rig with like a green screen fabric that you bring around and then you'll have to place them in ways that you don't see their back and all sorts of challenges, but it, it's possible. There are workarounds. And so I just wanted to show you a little bit of him here. Um, after you have the environment, um, just what it looks like when we place the HVR into the environment. So right here, this is a NASA plane. This is the actual NASA plane that they used um, when mapping the fjords in Greenland. So part of um, their research is to send these probes from the plane into the fjords and it's to measure um, one how deep they go and also what temperature it's at because again the big reveal not to like 
uh, spoil the story is it matters less what's happening to the glaciers above the water and with the air. A lot of it has to do with the warmer waters eating away at the glaciers from below, and that's really what's going to shift the sea sea level rise projections. So here's the ship. In the back right there is the probe um, that they drop it from. And again, we did photogrammetry of this plane. And then I'll just show you the HVR. You'll see him in his flight suit because the interview you saw there was from an earlier scene. Um, so that's why he's wearing different clothes. We didn't like paint those clothes on. This is NASA 2, the Gulfstream 3 that is my home for about five weeks a year when we're in Greenland taking measurements. It's probably the most important platform we have for our mission because it allows us to get to every corner of Greenland in just a few weeks. And another little fun fact, this was something that actually um, uh, we developed that worked really, really well. So out the windows, right, you're seeing you can't see it here very well. 2D does no, it just doesn't do justice to VR. But anyways, you can see the glaciers going by. And again, that's not like computer graphic work we did. Those are the actual glaciers. What we did is um, we uh, strapped an Ozo camera um, to a pole and we flew over um, the glacier areas and the fjords that they flew over, um, filming in 360. And so while the, sh while the plane is photogrammetry work, we then layered the 360 outside of the plane and then took the HVR of the scientist and put him in here. And it um, works really, really well for the motion issue that people encounter, right? The fact that like our inner ear can detect when we're moving and when we're not. And so when images are moving but we're not, it completely throws us and it makes you nauseous and have vertigo and all that. And so we had this gorgeous footage of Jakobshavn Glacier, um, which is a really important glacier. It's a very big glacier, and it's the one where they believe um, the iceberg broke off that hit the Titanic. And so we've got this um, 360 footage, and we're like, it's amazing, it's beautiful, and you can see the scope, the scope of it, right? Just how much ice is like flowing into these waters. But everyone's going to be sick. So is there any way to like deal with that? <laughs> and so what we did was, again, we did a um, for this one, we did a CGI because we didn't have access to the, um, the helicopter, but it's the exact model of the helicopter. We built it off of the 360 of the helicopter that we actually had. So we have a photogrammetry helicopter and then outside 360. And because you're in a stable environment, the photogrammetry is stable and stationary, it has this like grounding effect. So actually a lot less people feel nauseous than if you were just like floating out in the water and right in the 360s passing you by. Um, so yeah, it, very cool. Worked really well. Super effectful, effect, impactful. Like a lot of people comment on that um, that moment in the VR documentary. And so I mentioned research at the top, uh, and that is because as part of the grant, it's to learn from our VR. It's not just to make three great VR documentaries, but to really learn and ask some tough questions of ourselves and then share that with the community. So we partnered um, with USC's Media Impact Project, and they were great. It was awesome because. We could have gone to a firm, but a firm eh, kind of want to tell you what you want to hear. And what I liked about this is like they bring an academic rigor to this, which you guys all know, where they're like, we're just going to tell you what we find. It doesn't matter whether it fits like what you hope your answer is to be, um, which is VR journalism. It's going to be great for the journalism space, and everyone's going to love it, and everything you did was successful. And obviously, that's not the case. So um, these are the two primary research questions that were asked of our subject. What is the general audience response to VR, a VR journalism experience? And there were a subset of questions that we asked about that from basically did it, incur did it um, uh, pique your interest to explore a topic more? So for solitary, like were you interested in, in exploring you know, what's happening with incarceration more? Same thing with Greenland, right? Are you interested in exploring, again, climate change and what's happening with Greenland? There's a bunch of different questions there. Would you pursue other VR journalism. But this is the one that I think is like way more interesting. Does audience impact differ based on platform? So we did, um, we have the walk around volumetric VR of these experiences and then we created 360 versions of them, right? And we had some people do the walk around um, experience and some people do the version that was um, on a 360 video in a Samsung gear and then the third, um, uh, set of people did it on a computer. So it's 360 and you can like move your mouse around um, and just to see if there were differences in viewing experience given the platform. So again, um, in terms of the general response to, to the VR work, um, 
people actually were more moved by the um, walk around VR than by the video in the headset or on the screen. Um, and it was, it was substantial. And in terms of checking out um, other VR journalism, that prompted people far more than seeing a 360 video. They were much more likely to want to um, try other VR journalism, given that. Um, so yeah, so RuneScale inspired the most interest in VR journalism. RuneScale VR was the most effective platform for creating a sense of spatial presence, which makes sense because there's more spatial elements to it than a 360 video. Um, and it's not yet clear if changes in attitude and behavior differ by platform. All participants reported increased knowledge and interest in the issue, but details were hard to absorb. And I think this is the kicker, especially for Frontline, which does complex narratives and investigative work where details matter. Um, statistics sometimes matter and nuances matter. But in general, so everyone cared more about solitary or, or climate change and they got the general premise they're like the glaciers in Greenland are melting faster and that has to do with water below but when it came to those details that was another thing so like for example this is one of the questions we asked them after viewing if all of Greenland melted how much would it raise global sea level and this is like the big opening that will lime and reeds right and sets the stakes for us um, and it was just interesting to see like how many people like were not able to um, retain that. So knowledge acquisition was hard. I'd just be curious. So this one, you guys, it's cheating because you guys haven't seen the experience. But um, so raise your hand if you think it, if it's going to raise sea level rise by um, five feet or less. Raise your hand if you think it's going to be ten feet or less. Raise your hand if it's going to be fifteen feet or less. Raise your hand if it's going to be 20 feet or less. Yeah. Well, it's 20. And most of the people, even though we told them, didn't get it, especially when it was in room scale VR. So it actually it did, it did okay. Like it wasn't terrible. It wasn't terrible. But here you go at 50%, right? Well, hopefully more than 50% of people get the information. But this is the difference between watching it in a Samsung gear on your computer versus doing the walk around VR. And I mean, there's... Uh, a lot of hypotheses as, why that, as to why that is. I mean, one, like, it's new. For a lot of these people, they hadn't even seen a, a room scale VR experience before. So it's just fun to twirl around, right, in room scale if you haven't seen it before. So most of the time, you're just going to be twirling. Um, but even if we get past that hurdle, right, even if people, this becomes the norm and they've experienced it a lot, there's just a lot more stimuli to take in. So will that... Um, uh, counteract some of the ability to pay attention um, and to listen and hear something when there's so much to look at. Um, it's just a, a really interesting point that we have to think about. Are you familiar with that study that came out of Stanford a couple of years ago? Was this the one about the main, they didn't even remember the character's name? It may have been, there was one where like they did, um, I know that they looked at it and they had people witness the same story in 360 in 180, so they only got 180 visuals, and then 90 degrees worth of visuals. Mm -hmm. And basically, everyone in the 360 couldn't say the main character's name. Like, they like, didn't know what the main character's name was, um, which was different. People in the 90, just seeing 90 degrees worth of the visuals could recall the name. So yeah, it's going to be a real challenge for telling educational, journalistic, investigative, complex narratives. So overall, um, yeah, room scale VR was uh, found to be the most effective way to create a feeling of being there for environments with unique spatial characteristics. But participants' ability to actively explore the space rather than passively absorb information may present a challenge for telling complex narratives or information-dense sequences. So balancing, the, balancing these characteristics is a key to developing journalistic content in VR. And another thing that they proposed as a hypothesis was, will you understand more if it's procedural learning? So learning by doing. So the big takeaway from Greenland was that like what's happening below the water is like more important than what's happening above. And that moment is not a line of narration. That is a full embodied moment where um, basically we take you above one of the big glaciers that they mapped and you're above it. You can see just how far it goes, how expansive it is. And then we drop you at um, neck level in, in the water, right? And at, once you're neck level in the water, which is already disorienting, and so that triggers you to pay attention, it just feels like, again, you're not underwater, but we all know we have a human instinct of like, 
I'm up to my neck in water, right? And that's discomforting. And so you just maybe jolt up a little bit. And then we say, we tell the viewers to look under the water and we show them what the NASA's bathymetry data is finding. And so at that moment where the viewer literally has to like duck under the water and the audio changes, like everyone got it, everyone remembered it. So again, procedural learning, learning by doing. So for our third project, which is an investigation, these two are not, After Solitary and Greenland are not investigative pieces. For our third one, which is, um, we're really exploring how do we get people to absorb the information by doing and if we can control the pace, let the viewer control the pace, not the storyteller and the director control the pace, will that help? So for all these other experiences, you cannot stop the flow of information, you're not triggering the flow of information. Um, but for the third project, we are trying to do that, especially for the moments where it's like a detail, we're trying to give to you. If you have the ability to be like, oh, I just got tripped up by that, I'm not, I'm not ready for the next piece of information, okay, now I am, and now I, what I do cues the next piece of information. Will that help with people understanding complex narratives? Did you explore, the, like, uh, if people that learn from experience remember better than the So that's, that's the, the hypothesis. I hope we get the funding to okay. test the third one because that will be the real challenge. What I can tell you anecdotally from the Greenland melting one, because that, the after solitary, there's no doing. It's literally you're in a room and you can walk and that's it. Um, for Greenland, that there is that one moment of doing and anecdotally, every time I've read it, everyone remembers it, everyone get, got that point. So, anecdotally. I know, I know. And then other people learn different. Like some people are better learning by auditory methods. Some people are visual learners. Some people learn by doing. So, we'll see. I, I hope we get the funding to, to test the third one to see if it works. So um, some mistakes that we made, so you don't have to. The most important one, you have to ask yourself why VR? There's so many of the projects that we did where we're just like, well, we're doing a film on it, we have a team that's going there, so I guess we'll just do that. Um, and it's just not as powerful. And you really, here's the, the, the big question. When I say why VR, that's just a little bit more vague, but this is just a more sort of specific question to ask yourself. What can you convey more powerfully in VR than another medium? So whether that's a print story or a linear documentary, if you can't answer that question, it's probably not a great reason to be doing it in VR. Or you have to think about, again, the VR tools that are going to allow you to convey something more powerfully. Um, actually, at Harvard, I took some um, animation courses. And I always remember this anecdote that one of my uh, animation professors told me, which was like, basically, you know, obviously drawing has been around for many, 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 many years. And so, you know, back in the day when they didn't have photography, of course they're trying to do, you know, that realistic bowl of fruit or that realistic portrait. Like, that was the only way to do that, to convey that information. Now that already exists, so why animate some kind of bowl of fruit uh, or something that's realistic? Um, when you can take a video, you can take a photo, you can do it in so many different ways. So what does animation allow you to do that the other mediums don't? And here is like break reality entirely. It just it really stuck out, you know, Wiley Coyote's gonna actually run into that wall. You have to know see the second part of it, which is I think the best part. So the bird runs through and then of course when he tries to run at it, he hits the wall and, and falls back. So I think it's really important to do the same thing with VR. What does VR allow you to do that the other mediums don't allow you to do? And so one of the things that we're finding is that it's, again, more this idea of story living than storytelling. The more passive, where you're trying to tell people information, they're just not going to get it. But when they're doing, when it's like they're actually <laughs> walking, right? When they're actually going under the water, like, they get it. Like, they get it. So, again, try to think about living your stories. As the director, having your viewer live the story not tell them a story. Um, so uh, VR is not gonna make a bad story good. So that was the question, is VR really the best way to tell your story? Um, you have to just accept that technology is gonna get in the way of story, and that's probably hard. And like, it's great that there are people um, like you trying to make the technology better, um, and, and there will be more, and there are so many people out there, and there is a lot of money, but you just kinda have to get over it, and. Uh, to counteract that, I think if you're trying to tell a really good story, think about how you can simplify the story and simplify the tech. So even with like the 360 documentaries, 
we would never do that 12 camera GoPro stereoscopic rig anymore. You're just not gonna do that. First of all, most people can't tell the difference between monoscopic and stereoscopic. You might get a little bit more of a 3D effect and when the headsets get better like and, and people get more attuned to VR, sure, it probably will matter. But like right now, if you do a monoscopic one camera, you've just cut your stitching in half. If you have two cameras, there's even less stitching to to, so you can focus more on the story, right? Um, and it's the same thing, like, again, a really simple story. I mean, all of you guys know the enemy project from the past, but I think, again, it's a very simple way that he tells the story, but it's so much more powerful because it, because you're gonna run into too, too many challenges, and then you're gonna have the most clunky storytelling that's out there. So just because you use cool tools is not gonna make it cool. Um, I think another one is like, you know, notes on blindness. Again, really simple in the visuals and the aesthetics, right? And it's it's a single audio track. It's just like, it's great. Like it's just dealing with the fact that the tech's not there. So let's simplify. Um, and so VR journalism is tough, man. So. The complex narratives, we've been working on this murder investigation for a long time. To be honest, I don't know if we're going to solve our storytelling challenges in the third act. That's like when we're trying to convey the nuances of it. Um, and we've been pulling it apart and putting it back together, pulling it apart, pulling it back together. And you just have to ask yourself, was this the right story to tell in VR? And we'll ask ourselves that after it. Um, another thing is there's new layers of fact checking. For the most part, a lot of the, um, you know, Journalism best practices are going to apply to VR, right? Um, it's the same thing. Uh, uh, same thing with print, uh, documentary. If you have like good tenets of journalism, um, then you'll you'll do fine. But here's one that was like a little bit mind blowing for us, and we're still actually working on it. There's a lot more visuals to vet. So even with a linear doc, we might vet some visual, right? Try to find out if this camera footage that we have is actual camera footage or faked or anything like that. But for the murder investigation, we couldn't get into the crime scene, right? The crime scene's long gone. It's 2012 that that happened. But we did have uh, police body camera footage of the whole entire crime scene. We had all of the crime scene photos. Um, there was even like the LIDAR data where they measure the different distances because police do that actually more than actually taking like tape measures out anymore, right? And they just scan the room. So we had a lot of data to pull from, but it's, a, it's one where you need the crime scene and you need to visualize it and we can't get in and it doesn't exist anymore. So create it as realistically and as accurately as possible. But now there are so many visuals to fact check. So for example, you're gonna be in the, in the living room and you could walk into the kitchen and the room was ransacked because it was a burglary and there's all the shelves pulled out and so you look in a shelf because you can you can look in that shelf and what's in that shelf a book we have to say like is was a book there you know you've got artists and gamers and programmers being like well that looks cool uh, and you can you because you can do it and you would think it's there here um uh uh, poker for the fireplace because this is a fireplace and now it looks more like a fireplace and that's great But was it actually there right and does it certainly change the the editorial context of what happened? So we have like literally three people and this whole methodical system of blocking it out in quadrants and having multiple people one review the quadrant the second one review the quadrant and there's both errors for what's in there and errors of omission uh, and you have to deal with the fact that it's very expensive to create these um, very accurate recreations so we'll have to decide what's important and what's not so um, that's one where it is really a new layer um, that VR brings to it in terms of the fact checking so I just want to leave you with these three questions to consider when pursuing VR which is, can you take me somewhere few get to go? Um, can you show me something that I can't see? And can you transcend reality? I think if you can focus on those three things, you'll end up with a more powerful story in the end if you can focus on one of those. So, yeah.